Okay, no audio. Uh, okay. That seems to happen to me every time. All right. There was no audio for a few seconds, but nobody was here. Anyway, episode five of Church History, Shalom Case and Show. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Today, we're talking about Ignatius of Antioch. We're going to talk about a couple of heresies, including Marcionism, Gnosticism, and Montanism, as well as Justin Martyr's first apology. But as always, we're going to start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. So we we left off with St. John dying in Ephesus, and the Gospel of John was completed around that same time. Now let's talk a little bit about 10 years later in AD 110, Ignatius of Antioch used the term Catholic Church in a letter to the church at Smyrna, which was a Greek city located at a strategic point on the Aegean coast. Letters of undisputed authenticity, that means absolutely authentic, uh, attributed to him. In this and other genuine letters, he insists on the importance of the bishops in the church and speaks harshly about heretics and Judaizers. We're going to talk about heretics a little bit, but first, let's talk about Ignatius Antioch. He was known as Ignatius the Ephorus or Ignatius Nurono, the fire bearer, or uh, the Ephorus means the God bearing. He was an early Christian writer and bishop of Antioch. While en route to Rome, where he met his martyrdom, Ignatius wrote a series of letters. This correspondence now forms a central part of a later collection of works known to be authored by the Apostolic Fathers. He is considered to be one of the three most important of these, together with Clement of Rome and Polycarp. So there's the three most important Apostolic Fathers, which are Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, and Polycarp. So if you have time to read about the Apostolic Fathers, check out these three Apostolic Fathers first, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, and Polycarp. His letters also serve as an example of er early Christian theology. Important topics they address include ecclesiology, the sacraments, and the role of bishops. So let's talk about his life a little bit. Nothing is, is known of Ignatius' life apart from what may be inferred internally from his letters, except from later, sometimes spurious, traditions. It is said Ignatius converted to Christianity at a young age. Tradition identifies Ignatius, along with his friend Polycarp, as disciples of John the Apostle. Later in his life, Ignatius was chosen to serve as Bishop of Antioch in the 4th century in the 4th century church historian Sibius writes that he succeeded Evodius. Dord of Cyrus claimed that St. Peter himself left directions that Ignatius be appointed to the Episcopal See of Antioch. So some people say that it was actually St. Peter who puts um, Ignatius of Antioch in charge. Ignatius called himself Theophorus, which means God bearer. A tradition arose that he was one of the children whom Jesus took in his arms and blessed. <laughs> That is an interesting tradition. I've never heard that before. Although if he was born around AD 50, as supposed, then Jesus had been crucified approximately 20 years prior. So that's just a interesting tradition. It's, we don't know if it's actually true or not. All right, veneration. Ignatius feast day was kept in his own Antioch on the 17th of October, the day on which he is now celebrated in the Catholic Church and generally in Western Christianity. Although from the 12th century until 1969, it was put at the 1st of February in the general Roman calendar. In the Eastern Orthodox, oh, excuse me, <laughs> Orthodox Church, it is observed on the 20th of December. The Synaxarium of the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria place it on the 24th of the Coptic month of Koag, which is also the 24th day of the fourth month of Tahisas in the Synaxarium of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tuwahedo Church. That's very hard to say. Sorry if I butchered it. But basically, different churches celebrate his death on different days. Um, and we're going to move on to his martyrdom. So instead of being executed in his hometown of Antioch, Ignatius was escort, escorted to Rome by a company of 10 Roman soldiers. This is from his letter, Ignatius to the Romans, quote, from Syria, even unto Rome, I fight with beasts, both by land and sea, both by night and day, being bound to 10 leopards, I mean, a band of soldiers. So he's saying 10 soldiers were holding him. 
Scholars consider Ignatius' transport to Rome unusual, since those persecuted as Christians would be expected to be punished locally. Stephen Davies has pointed out that no other examples exist from the Flavian Age of any prisoners except citizens or prisoners of war being brought to Rome for persecution, for, I'm sorry, for execution. If Ignatius were a Roman citizen, he would have appealed to the emperor, but then he would usually have been beheaded rather than tortured. Furthermore, the epistles of Ignatius state that he was put in chains during the journey to Rome, but it was illegal under Roman law for a citizen to be put in bonds during an appeal to the emperor. Alan Brent argues that Ignatius was transferred to Rome at the request of the emperor in order to provide entertainment to the masses by being killed in the Colosseum. Brent insists, contrary to some, that, quote, it was a normal practice to transport condemned criminals from provinces and offer spectator in the Colosseum at Rome. So people kind of understand why was he sent to Rome? Nobody really knows. So you scholars debate about it. Stephen Davies, uh, sorry, Stephen Davies rejects the idea that Ignatius was transported to Rome for the games at the Colosseum. He reasons that, quote, if Ignatius was in some way a donation by the imperial governor of Syria to the games at Rome, a single prisoner seems a rather miserly gift, unquote. Instead, Davies proposes that Ignatius may have been indicted by a legate or representative of the governor of Syria while the governor was away temporarily and sent to Rome for trial and execution. Under Roman law, only the governor of a province or the emperor himself could impose capital punishment, so the legate would have faced the choice of imprisoning Ignatius in Antioch or sending him to Rome. Davies postulates that the legate may have decided to send Ignatius to Rome as to minimize any further dissension among the Antiochian Christians. So basically, he sent them to Rome so that he wouldn't keep having problems with all the Christians. If he just put him in jail or executed him there unlawfully, people would have been really upset and he would have had even more problems by sending by, well, Davies believes that by sending Ignatius to Rome, he kind of settled some of those issues. Christ Christine Trevitt has called Davies' suggestion entirely hypothetical. And all these suggestions are hypothetical. We're just wondering about maybe what happened in history and concludes that no fully satisfactory solution to the problem can be found. Writing, quote, I tend to take the bishop at his word when he says he is a condemned man. But the question remains, why is he going to Rome? The truth is that we don't know. And that's the thing that we need to understand about a lot of history. Uh, we just don't know about a lot of history. We don't know why things happened, how they happened, unless someone wrote about them. And then, when he ha then we have to kind of trust what that person wrote because we really don't just don't have any other means of knowing what went on, basically. So that's one of the things I really love about history is that we can look at these documents from a long time ago and kind of get an idea of what was going on, but we'll never truly know. But we can still learn something. And the purpose of learning about anything, especially about history, is to learn from others' mistakes, not repeat them, and learn from others' uh, virtues, others' benefits, and to do more of those. All right, moving on. Route of travel to Rome. During the journey to Rome, Ignatius and his entourage of soldiers made a number of lengthy stops in Asia Minor, devi deviating from the most direct land route from Antioch to Rome. Scholars generally agree on the following reconstruction of Ignatius' route of travel. First, Ignatius traveled from Antioch in the province of Syria to Asia Minor. It is uncertain whether he traveled by sea or by land. Second, he was taken to Shia via a route that bypassed the cities of Magnesia, Trales, and if and if Ephesus, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but likely passed through Philadelphia. Ignatius then traveled to Traus, where he boarded a ship bound for Neapolis in Macedonia. Fourth, he then passed through the city of Philippi. Lastly, after this, he took some land or sea route to Rome. During the journey, the soldiers seem to have allowed Ignatius to meet with entire congregations of Christians while in chains, at least while he was in Philadelphia. And numerous Christian visitors and messengers were allowed to meet with him on a one-on-one -on -one basis. These messengers allowed Ignatius to send six letters to nearby churches and one to Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna. And we will be talking about Polycarp at a later time. These aspects of Ignatius' martyrdom are also regarded by scholars as unusual. It is generally expected that a prisoner would be transported on the most direct, 
cost-effective route to their destination, since travel by land in the Roman Empire was between 52 times more expensive than travel by sea, and Antioch was a port city. The most efficient route would likely have been entirely by sea. Stephen Davies argues that Ignatius' circuitous route to Rome can only be explained by positing that he was not the main purpose of the soldier's trip and that the various stops in Asia Minor were for other state business. He suggests that such a scenario would also explain the relative, the relative freedom that Ignatius was given to meet with other Christians during the journey. So it's a very interesting journey that Ignatius had, a sad but interesting journey as he was these letters and meet with many Christians in the area and actually these letters out and we to this very day still have those letters. Okay, let's talk about the date of martyrdom. Due to the fragmentary nature documentation of Ignatius' life and martyrdom, the date of his death is subject to a significant amount of uncertainty. Tradition places the martyrdom of Ignatius in the reign of Trajan, who was the emperor of Rome from 98 to 117 AD. But the earliest source for this Trajanic date is the 4th century church Eusebius of Maria, who is regarded by some scholars as an unreliable source for chronological information regarding the early church. Eusebius had an ideological interest in dating church leaders as early as possible and ensuring that there were no gaps in succession between the original apostles of Jesus and the leaders of the church in his day. Unfortunately, the epistles attributed to Ignatius provide no clear indication as to their date. So we really don't know when he wrote them, but we have a pretty good idea based on some of the people he was talking to and things like things that he wrote. So while many scholars accept the traditional dating of Ignatius martyrdom under Trajan, others have argued for a somewhat later date. Richard Purvo dated Ignatius' death to 135 uh, or 140 AD. British classicist Timothy Barnes has argued for a date in the 140s AD. On the grounds that Ignatius seemed to have quoted a work of the Gnostic Ptolemy in one of his epistles who came active in the 130s. So we don't know for sure, but it was around this time frame. And it, and what uh, makes me feel good about it is that it's not a huge gap. It's not like from 100 to 300. He, it's a pretty tight period of, of a couple of decades. You know, we just, we don't know exactly. It was between about 100 and 10 and 140, which is not that big of a jump, especially considering this was over 2,000 years ago. Okay, death and aftermath. Ignatius himself wrote that he would be thrown to the beast, and in the 4th century, Eusebius reports tra tradition that this came to pass, which is then repeated by Jerome, who is the first to explicitly mention lions. John Chrysostom is the first to allude to the Colosseum as the place of Ignatius' martyrdom. Contemporary scholars are uncertain that any of these authors had sources other than Ignatius' own writing. According to a medieval Christian text titled Martyrium Ignatii, Ignatius' remains were carried back to Antioch by his companions after his martyrdom. The 6th century writings of Evagrius Scholasticus state that the reputed remains of Ignatius were removed by the emperor, emperor Theodosius II in the Tycheum or Temple of Tyche, which had been converted into a church dedicated to Ignatius. In 67, the relics were transferred to the San Clemente in Rome. And relics are just um, basically physical remains of a saint or personal effects of a saint that people keep so that they can remember that person, they can venerate that person. Okay, the Martyrum Martyrium Ignatii. There is a purported eyewitness account of his martyrdom named Martyrium Ignatii of medieval date. It is presented as being an eyewitness account for the Church of Antioch, attributed it to Ignatius' companions Philo of Cil Cilicia, deacon of Tarsus, and Reus Agothapus, a Syrian. Although James Usher regarded it as genuine, the authenticity of the account is seriously questioned. If there is any genuine nucleus of the martyrium, it has been so greatly expanded with interpolations that no part of it is without questions. Its most reliable manuscript is the 10th century Codex Cobertinus, which is from Paris, in which the martyrium closes the collection. The martyrium presents the confrontation of the Bishop Ignatius with Trajan at Antioch, a familiar trope of Acta of the Martyrs, and many details of the long, partly overland voyage to Rome. The Synaxarium of the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria says that he was thrown to the wild beast that devoured him and rent him to pieces. So 
He wrote seven epistles. We're going to talk a little bit about the epistles, but not too much because we have other things to get to. Um, so, and it's already been 50 minutes. So the following seven epistles preserved under the name of of Ignatius are generally considered authentic since they were mentioned by the historian Eusebius in the first half of the fourth century. We have the epistle to the Ephesians where Ignatius of Antioch um, is addressing the church of Ephesus in Asia Minor. We have the epistle to the Magnesians, the epistle to the Trillians, to the Romans, to the Philadelphians, to the Smyrnians one to Polycarp, and yeah, that is all seven. So you can actually read all these epistles on New Advent, I believe it's newadvent.org. And they're very interesting because they are very um, authentic. M most historians believe that these are truly written by Ignatius in the first century. So these were, as well as the Gospels, were some of the first Christian documents written. So that is enough about Ignatius of Antioch. So we're going to move on to the next thing is we have uh, Latin translations from the Greek text of the scriptures are circulated among non-Greek speaking Christian communities. And basically, this is just a way to spread the Bible more, which is the same thing we do to this very day. We're continuously translating the Bible, and I think that is an awesome thing. I personally prefer an older translation, which is called the Douay Reims, but um, newer translations are great as well, and I do not do not have a pref preference as far as, oh, is this the best one or is that the best one? I think it's great that people are putting out more and new translations with different ways of, you know, expressing the text, because when you translate something from Greek or Latin or Hebrew, you just can't do it one to one. There are different ways to do it. And I think that's great that we have different translations. Me personally, I like it when the church actually says, hey, this is an approved translation. We looked over everything and nothing is kind of weird or written in, in the wrong way or translated in the wrong way. But hey, that's, uh, that's a whole nother topic that we're not going to go into. Now let's talk about around 154, the teachings of Marcion, uh, Gnosticism, and Montanism caused disruption, disruptions in the Roman community. Persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire continues. So let's talk about Marcion. Uh, we'll close Antioch. Okay, Marcion of Sinope was an important figure in early Christianity. Marcion preached that the God who sent Jesus into the world was a different, higher deity than the creator God of Judaism. He considered himself a follower of Paul, the apostle, who he believed to have been the only true apostle of Jesus Christ. He published the earliest extant fixed collection of New Testament books, making him a vital figure in the development of Christian history. Church fathers such as Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and Tertullian denounced Marcion as a heretic, and of course, I agree, and he was excommunicated by the Church of Rome around 144 AD. He published the first known canon of Christian scriptures, but here's the problem. It's I mean, it's good that I guess some historians want to say, hey, he published the first one. Cool. But if it's wrong, then like, what does it matter if it's the first one? That's almost like everybody's racing and they're doing a foot race through the woods. You take a helicopter and land at the finish line. And you're like, I'm the first one. Cool. Everybody in history remembers you as the first one. But what they don't mention is that you took a helicopter. You did it wrong. So Marcion came up with his own his own teachings that Jesus is a different, you know, God than the God of Judaism, made his own Bible. I mean, what does it matter if he was the first Bible, if it was totally wrong? So, I mean, I understand that historians are only worried about history itself, but this is the reason why you need kind of religion and faith along with history so that you know what to do with the history and you're not just reading things and kind of speculating about it. Okay. So um, Marcion's Bible contained 10 Pauline epistles, letters of Paul, and a shorter version of the Gospel of Luke, and which he called the Gospel of Marcion. This made him a catalyst in the process of the development of the New Testament canon by forcing proto, the proto-Orthodox Church to respond to his canon. And, and Rose. 
Okay, yeah, computer froze a little bit. Don't know what happened there. All right, let's talk about his teachings. I don't really need to talk about his life too much. So, study of the Hebrew scriptures, along with received writings circulating in the Nansen church, led Marcion to conclude that many of the teachings of Jesus were incompatible with the actions of Yahweh, the belligerent God of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, these aren't my beliefs. These are Marcion's beliefs. So, if you hear something that sounds heretical, uh, you know, it is heretical. All right. It's not, I'm not saying I believe this. I'm just telling you what he believed. Okay. Marcion responded by developing a diatheistic system of belief around the year AD 144. This notion of two gods, a higher transcendent one and a lower world creator and ruler, allowed Marcion to reconcile his perceived contradictions between Christian Old Covenant theology and the gospel message proclaimed by the New Testament. In contrast to other leaders of the nascent Christian church, however, Marcion declared that Christianity was in complete discontinuity discontinuity with Judaism. Okay, so the Catholic Church always believed that Judaism never just stopped and got destroyed. They always believed that what they were doing was the fulfillment of Judaism. They never believed that they were just getting rid of it or it was turning into something different. They believed Jesus came to fulfill Judaism. He is the new sacrifice. We're not changing anything. We're just fulfilling it. We're making it better. So it's like taking a house and, you know, pressure washing and cleaning, putting new plants outside. You're not making a new house. You're just taking the house that was there and fulfilling it in its beauty by making everything clean and putting new plants and everything. So Catholics have always believed that from day one, and we still believe that to this very day. Marcion did not believe that. He believed that it was a complete split. So he entirely was opposed to the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible. Marcion did not claim that the Jewish scriptures were false. Instead, he asserted that they were to be read in an absolutely literal manner, thereby developing an understanding that Yahweh was not the same God spoken of by Jesus. For example, Marcion argued that the Genesis account of Yahweh walking through the Garden of Eden, asking where Adam was, had proved that Yahweh inhabited a physical body and was without universal knowledge attributes wholly incompatible with the heavenly father professed by Jesus. Again, I want to state that these are not my views. These are Marcion's views. They're heretical. You should not believe them. There were not two gods. There's only one God. And some people believe this to this very day. They want to separate the old, quote unquote, Old Testament God and quote unquote, New Testament God. No, there's only one God. And if you read the Bible and if you truly understand it, you'll realize that there wasn't, there's not any difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And in fact, there's um, quotes in the Old Testament about God being like a mother and so loving and things like that. It's the same in the New Testament. There were just different ways of speaking about it. Okay, so moving on. According to Marcion, the God of the Old Testament, whom he called the Demiurge, the creator of the material universe, is a jealous and tribal deity of the Jews, whose law represents legalistic reciprocal justice, who punishes mankind for its sins through suffering and death. In contrast, the God that Jesus professed is an altogether different being, a universal God of compassion and love who looks upon humanity with benevolence and mercy. Marcion also produced a book titled Antithesis, which is no longer extant. It means it doesn't exist anymore. We can't find copies. Contrasting the demiurge of the Old Testament with the Heavenly Father of the New Testament. Marcion held Jesus to be the son of the Heavenly Father, but understood the incarnation in a docetic manner. And I guess docetism means that Jesus' body was only an imitation of a material body and consequently denied Jesus' physical and bodily birth, death, and resurrection, which is another huge heresy that the Gnostics believe that Jesus never really died. He's God. He can't really die. That wouldn't be okay for God to do. So it was just an imitation. It was just a mirage, which is, of course, heresy. Marcion was the first to introduce a Christian canon, which is, like I said, with the race, if you get to the finish line by a helicopter and everybody's doing a foot race, what does it matter? I don't know why they keep repeating this particular line. It's not really important. But anyway, his canon consisted of only 11 books grouped into two sections, the Evangelicon, a shorter version of the Gospel of Luke, and the Apostolicon, a selection of 10 epistles of Paul the Apostle, which were also slightly shorter than the canonical text. 
Early Christians such as Arrhenius, Tertullian, and Epiphanius claimed that Marcion's editions of Luke and the Pauline epistles were intentionally edited by Marcion to match his theological views, and many modern scholars agree. So basically, Marcion, in order to back up his heresy, edited his quote-unquote Bible to agree with him. Of course, who wouldn't? Sorry, hit my mic here. However, some scholars argue that Marcion's texts were not substantially edited by him and may in some respects represent an earlier version of these texts than the canonical versions. Like the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel used by Marcion did not contain elements relating to Jesus' birth and childhood. Interestingly, it did contain some Jewish elements and material that challenged Marcion's ditheism, a fact that was exploited by early Christians in their polemics against Marcion. And polemics is just basically... Um, the way you argue against somebody. The centrality of the Pauline epistles in Marcion's canon reflects the fact that Marcion considered Paul to be the correct interpreter and transmitter of Jesus' teachings in contrast to the 12 disciples of the early Jerusalem church. Marcion was deemed a heretic and boom, kicked out of the church. And yeah, we don't really, we still deal with some people who believe these kind of ideas today. We have some atheists who would like to argue, hey, you know, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, they're two totally different gods. And uh, they're just basically pulling up the old heresy of Marcion and, you know, presenting it as if it's something new. And we have already have lots of arguments to kind of back up that this is incorrect. All you have to do is look into Justin Martyr, Iranius, and Tertullian, they all denounce Marcion, and they all have letters and things written, which you can find at newadvent.org. Not my website, but it's a great website. I would always promote it because I learned a lot of what I know from that website. Go on to newadvent.org, search, you know, Marcionism, and you'll find a lot more information. Next up, we have uh, Valentia, Valentinus, which is also known as Gnosticism. So Valentinus was the best known and for a time most successful early Christian Gnostic theologian. He found his school in Rome. According to Tertullian, Valentinus was a candidate for bishop but started his own group when another was chosen. Valentinus produced a variety of writings but only fragments survived, largely those embedded in refuted quotations in the works of his opponents. So basically the only things the only letters and books that he wrote that survived were quotes of him from people who were basically bashing him. So people are saying, hey, he's wrong, and I'm going to quote him here and show why he's wrong. That's the only thing we have surviving of him. Okay, so not enough to reconstruct his system except in broad outline. His doctrine is known only in the, the developed and modified form given to it by his disciples. He taught that there were three kinds of people, the spiritual, physical, and material and that only those of a spiritual nature received gnosis, which is Greek for knowledge, that allowed them to return to the divine pleroma. And pleroma is like a um, the totality of divine power. Basically, you can go back to God. While those of a, sorry, I said physical, I meant to say psychical. Those of a psychic nature, ordinary Christians, would attain a lesser or uncertain form of salvation and that those of a material nature were doomed to perish. Again, these are heretical views. I'm talking about them because, hey, it's a part of church history, but I don't want you to confuse my views with heretical views, okay? Valentinus had a large following, the Valentinians. It later divided into an Eastern and a Western branch. The, Mar the Marcosians belonged to the Western branch. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Valentin Valentinianism. Valentinianism is the name for the school of Gnostic philosophy tracing back to Valentinus. It was one of the major Gnostic movements having widespread following throughout the Roman Empire and provoking vol voluminous writings by Christian heresiologists. Notable Valentinians included Heracleon, Ptolemy, Florinus, Marcus, and Axonicus. Valentinus professed to have derived his ideas from Theodos or Theudas, a disciple of Paul. Valentinus drew freely on some books of the New Testament. Unlike a great number of other Gnostic systems which are expressed dualists, when a dualist means that there's basically um, that there's two fundamental concepts that oppose each other. So like a bad God and a good God, basically. Valentinus developed a system that was more monistic, and monistic means that there's a oneness or a singleness to everything. 
So uh, Valentinus was alive, he made many disciples, and his system was the most widely diffused of all the forms of Gnosticism, although, as Tertullian remarked, it developed into several different versions, not all of which acknowledged their dependence on him. Among the more prominent disciples of Valentinus were Heraclon, Ptolemy, Marcus, and possibly Bardazon. Many of the writings of these Gnostics and a large number of excerpts from the writings of Valentinus existed only in quotes displayed by their orthodox detractors until 1945 when the cachet of writings at Nag Hammadi revealed a Coptic version of the Gospel of Truth, which is the title of a text that, according to Irenaeus, was the same as the Gospel of Valentinus mentioned by Tertullian in his Against All Heresies. So if you want to know about heresies and you want to know about what church fathers were saying like 2000 years ago to defeat them because they're the same heresies that that popped up back then are the same heresies now go and check out for example against all heresies by tertullian at newadvent.org it's a great read so that's a little bit about valentinus valentinus yeah next up we have montanism all these heresies popped up around the same time so the early church was dealing with a lot of issues right in the very beginning. You have a lot of persecution. And by the time we get to about a hundred years later, where the last apostle just died, I mean, we're not even out of, we're not even like a hundred, 200 years out of apostle territory. We have the last apostle just dying in the year 100 and three, count them, one, two, three heresies, major heresies popped up right away. And even in the beginning, we had Judaizers who had popped up when the apostles were still alive. And Judaizers were basically Christians who wanted uh, Christians to follow all the Jewish laws, all the old Jewish laws, do everything Jewish, but, but just believe in Jesus. That was a big heresy in the very beginning, which they talk about in the book of Acts. And that's why they had to have the Council of Jerusalem and say, hey, look, you don't have to follow all the Jewish laws, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, just about 60 or so years later, we have three heresies. We have Gnosticism, we have um, Montanism, Marcionism, and Marcionism. So now we're going to talk about Montanism real quick. Montanism, known by its adherents as the New Prophecy, was an early Christian movement of the late second century, later referred to by the name of its founder, Montanus. Montanism held similar views about the basic tenets of Christian theology to those of the wider Christian church, but it was labeled a heresy for its belief in the new prophetic revelations. The prophetic movement called for a reliance on the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit and a more conservative personal ethic. Parallels have been drawn between Montanism and modern day movements such as Pentecostalism, including Oneness Pentecostals and the Charismatic Movement. So a lot of these heresies never die. They get, you know, they shine the light on them. These heretics scurry away, but they never die. They don't, you know, they don't just get killed and die out. They, they're, it's always floating around in either because the easiest lie, the easiest lie is a lie that takes the truth and twists it just a little bit. So for example, if I am, I don't know, going to work and I'm a little bit late, I can say, for example, I can go to work. I'm late because I don't know, maybe I was partying, out partying the night before and I was up until 2 a.m. I fell asleep. I missed my alarm. So I get to work, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes late. I come in and the boss is like, hey, what happened? And I say, you know what? I was up late working until about 2 a.m. and I just missed my alarm. I'm so sorry. But, you know, I just was really excited about getting work done for the school. So this is a lie, right? But it's just a slight change on what actually happened. It's just not, it's not a bold face, 100% lie. It's a small lie because guess what? I was up until 2 a.m. The difference is that I wasn't working. I was partying, but I was up until 2 a.m. So my story hasn't changed that much from the truth. So to tell you that I was up at 2 a.m., but I'm just slightly changing the reason why. And then maybe the boss will have a better understanding and maybe might feel sorry for me, whatever, whatever. But the easiest lies are the ones that take the truth as a basis and just twist it a little bit. And that's what the devil does to try to trick us up. That's what heresies are. And that's, you know, what I'm not saying Pentecostalism, one is Pentecostals and the charismatic movement are heresies, for example. I'm just saying that um, scholars are saying that there are parallels between these movements. I'm not saying in particular they are heresies. I'm not the judge of that, you know, but 
um, I'm just making the point that there are parallels between them and that the problem with the heresies is that they never look like heresies. They never look like heresies because, because they are, they have as a foundation the truth. As they're rock, they have the truth, and then they just twist a little bit in a different way, okay? So Montanism originated in Fergia, a province of Anatolia, and flourished throughout the region, leading to the movement being referred to elsewhere as Catafergian, meaning it was from Fergia or simply as Fergian. They were sometimes also called Papusians after Papusa, their new Jerusalem. Sometimes the Papusians were distinguished from other Montanists for despising those not living in the new Jerusalem. The, Mont the Montanist movement spread rapidly to other regions in the Roman Empire before Christianity was generally tolerated or legal. It persisted in some isolated places into the 6th century. So Montanism lasts for basically five, almost 500 years, four or 500 years. Okay, so let's talk about their beliefs. Because much of what is known about Montanism comes from anti-Montanist sources, it is difficult to know what they actually believed and how those beliefs differed from Christian mainstream of the time. The New Prophecy was also a diverse movement, and what Montanists believe varied by location and time. Montanism was particularly influenced by joining literature, especially the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse of John, also known as the Book of Revelation. In John's Gospel, Jesus promised to send the Paraclete, or Holy Spirit, from which Montanists believe their prophets derive inspiration. In the Apocalypse, John was taken by an angel to the top of a mountain where he sees the New Jerusalem descend to earth. Montanists identified this mountain as located in Fergia near Papusa. Now, don't we hear this all the time? I'm a prophet. I figured out that the world is happening each day at such place. I'm a prophet. I've seen that the stock market is going to crash at this time. I'm a prophet. And Jesus told me you need to do three backflips and that's how you're going to be saved and you won't have to worry about anything else. Three backflips. Just say, I love Jesus as soon as you do the backflip. And if you can't do a backflip, I don't know, you might not make it into heaven. Haven't we heard this so many times? This is this has been going on for since the church started. Even in the Bible, you have stories about people speaking in the name of Jesus who were not authorized to do so. And those people had bad things happen to them. That's in the book of Acts. So this has been going on since the beginning of the church. We even have Judas, right? And a lot of people wonder, in, or ask me because I'm Catholic. Oh man, you know, there were priests that are abusing kids and stuff. That Like, how can you be Catholic? And it's like, well, how can you be Christian? Judas betrayed Jesus. He was a Christian too. You can't say Judas wasn't a Christian. He was one of the first, he was what? One of the first 12 followers of Jesus. Of course he was a Christian. He believed. He believed he just, maybe he didn't believe enough or maybe he had some other shortcomings who knows? He betrayed Jesus. He killed him. Okay. So we have priests. We had priests back then. We had apostles who were, I mean, in anybody's, anybody can agree that an apostle is higher than a priest. We had apostles, an apostle who betrayed Jesus himself, the God man, right? So of course, we're going to have priests who are just successors of apostles who are going to betray Jesus as well. We're also going to have Kings and queens, presidents, senators, con Congress people, whatever. You're going to have all these people, whether they're Christians or not, they are going to bet betray Jesus. You're going to betray Jesus. I'm going to betray Jesus. However, some people are going to do it more spectacularly than others. There's always going to be Judas. And I was looking up something. I think one twelfth is 8% or something. I'm not sure. 8 times 12. and Yeah, it's like 8%. So if you want to look at it, and if you actually look at the numbers of the abuse that happened in the Catholic Church, it was something like that. A little bit less than 8% of the priests when they abused, the other 90, uh, the other 2% weren't doing anything wrong. They were doing their jobs, right? But those 8%, Judas will be always remembered. People who aren't Christians remember Judas. They remember like Peter and Judas, and that's pretty much it. Maybe they know Paul if they're not Christians. But if you say, who is Judas to 100 people and, you know, a non-Christian, you're going to say Judas is the guy that betrayed Jesus, right? So the people who had are remembered more than the people that do good. 
But also the point I'm making is that we um, I'm just kind of getting off in the weeds a little bit there. That's not the point I wanted to make. I wanted to make the point about prophecies. We've had people who've called themselves prophets since the since the beginning of Christianity who are not called to be prophets. We have people prophesying who aren't given the gift of prophecy. So be very careful with that. And it even says in the Bible, be very careful and you need to test these prophecies. And basically, if it's telling you to love Jesus more, it's a good prophecy. If it's telling you something else, you got to really test it and you really have to look in the Bible and talk to you know somebody else who is, is um, a theologian or something and really find out. Somebody who knows about theology. Hey, does this prophecy gel? You know? What's going on with it? Okay, so moving on. Followers, followers of the new prophecy call themselves spiritales, spiritual people, in contrast to their opponents whom they termed psychiki, which means carnal or natural people. Let's talk about the ecstatic prophecy. As the name new prophecy implied, Montanism was a movement focused around prophecy, specifically the prophecies of the movement's founders, which were believed to contain the Holy Spirit's revelation for the present age. Prophecy itself was not controversial within the second century Christian communities. However, the new prophecy, as described by Eusebius of Caesarea, departed from church tradition. Here's a quote from Eusebius. And he, Montanus, became beside himself, and being suddenly in a sort of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved and began to babble in utter strange things, prophesying in a manner contrary to the constant custom of the church handed down by tradition from the beginning. Now, some people will say, now, this sounds a little bit familiar. I'm black. I come from a black tradition of churches, you know, uh, Baptist churches, non-denominational, Pentecostal, what have you. He said, and this sounds familiar to me, he became beside himself and being suddenly in a sort of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved and began to babble and utter strange things. Okay. In the Bible, it says, I believe it was Paul says, if you're going to prophesy or if you're going to speak in tongues, that means in a different language, God is going to provide someone who is going to translate that. Not the same person, because we don't know. We don't have any idea what you're saying. You could you could ramble off whatever you want to say, babble off whatever you want to say and say, well, I said X, Y, Z. No, no, no. In the Bible, Paul says that if there's somebody speaking in tongues, there is going to be someone else who speaks that language who is going to be able to translate for everyone else. Why? Because if you're speaking in tongues and no one can understand it but you, that is not very beneficial. That's not really bringing anyone else closer to God. Some people might say this is my opinion, but it's actually what's in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. I'm not sure exactly which letter, but Paul did say that. Um, so, so that's why some people say that Montanism is very similar to uh, Pentecostalism, to charismatic movement because there is a lot of this supposedly speaking in tongues or becoming in the Holy Spirit, which involves kind of like an ecstasy, babbling, you know, strange movements and things like that. This was from way back and the church decided way back then that that's not how we should be doing things, right? The church decided way back then that we should, we should if we're inspired by God, then there should be you know, things in place that everyone can understand what's going on because the whole point is that we can get to heaven. That's the whole point, right? So everything should be thoroughly explained before or after the fact. We can't just have things happen and say, well, that, you know, that's just the Holy Spirit. That's just what it is, right? Okay, so moving on. The Montanist prophets did not speak as messengers of God, but were described as possessed by God while being unable to resist. And I've heard this and seen things like this before as well. I never really knew about Montanism, but it's making a lot of sense. Remember, like I said, old heresies never die. They really don't. They just come back around in a different format and call themselves a different name. Now you might ask, well, why is this particularly dangerous? We will find out more as we read. A prophetic utterance by Montanist described this possession state, quote, lo, the man is a liar, and I fly over him at the pick. The man sleepeth while I watch, unquote. Thus, the Fergians were seen as false prophets because they acted irrationally and were not in control of their senses. And this is something that a lot of people have seen in kind of Pentecostal and charismatic churches. People are not in control of themselves. And people feel like that, how could you be 
a true prophet when you don't see in the Bible this happening at all, people just losing control of themselves, saying things that don't make any sense, or, uh, you know, I'm not even going to go into all the details of things that I've seen. It never, in my opinion, it never made me holier. It never f made me feel like I want to become closer to Jesus because of these things I'm seeing. It made me uneasy. Maybe that's just my opinion. Actually, it's not just my opinion because there were lots of church fathers who preached against this kind of thing. So not just my opinion. All right. A criticism of Montanism was that its followers claimed their revelation received directly from the Holy Spirit could supersede the authority of Jesus or Paul the Apostle or anyone else. In some of its prophecies, Mont Montanus apparently, and somewhat like the oracles of the Greco-Roman world, spoke in the first person as God. And we know that's a heresy. You cannot speak as God. Nobody can. Now, you can say, well, God said this or that to me. But to say, I am the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, oh, no. That's definitely heresy territory right there. Total heresy. Okay. Many early Christians understood this to be Montanus claiming himself to be God. However, scholars agree that these words of Montanus exemplify the general practice of religious prophets to speak as the past mouthpieces of the divine and to claim divine inspiration. That practice occurred in, Christi in Christianity as well as in pagan circles with some degree of frequency. So they're trying to, some scholars are trying to wave it, hand wave it away. I don't believe Montanus was speaking as God either, but it is kind of tricky when, when you say I, when you're speaking as a prophet, you should say God said such and such to me, or God will say, hey, say to so-and-so that I said such and such as, because God doesn't want more confusion, right? We can think about a heresy this way. Is, is this teaching causing more confusion or less confusion? Is it more clear how to get to heaven or less clear, right? Complication is different. Complication doesn't mean that something isn't clear. For example, a watch is very complicated, but when you look at the face of the watch, you can clearly see what time of day it is, right? But it's very complicated inside. So the path to heaven could be very complicated, but it should be clear. You go this way and you walk down, it's going to be very difficult to get there. But at, once you get to the end, you're there, right? But when something's confusing, for example, you have a watch, but on there, the numbers are out of order. The hands go in reverse. You never know what time it is. Like, Leslie is never from God. God always gives more and more and more clarity, especially as time goes on. There's just more and more and more clarity, not less. So if something is confusing to you, let it go. As they say, let it go, let it go, right? I'm not going to bust in the song, but you know what I mean. So it, whenever you run into a teaching that seems new or novel, something seems a little strange, a little off, first you have to ask yourself, is this bringing me closer to first and foremost? Is this bringing me closer to Jesus? And if the answer is no, then you have to maybe, then you can just let it go because you already have in the Bible basically what you need to know about what Jesus taught, right? And we have theologians that can tell you a little bit more in that, and you can find them out there. They're very, um, they, they have the degrees and, you know, they've been teaching and you can see that they're teaching stuff that matches with what the Bible says. They're not teaching new things. They're just trying to explain better. So you can find those books and read about that, or you can read about the church fathers. You can find out what's true easily. If something is strange and looks weird and it just, seems off, you can just let it go. Just leave it. Because if it's not benefiting you, there's no reason to delve deeper into it when you already have the Bible here. You already have the church fathers. Why do you have to come up with something novel? All right, so let's talk about a few of the other beliefs of Montanism. On the resurrection of the flesh, Tertullian wrote that the Holy Spirit through the new prophecy cleared up the ambiguities of scripture. The new prophecies did not contain new doctrinal content, but mandated strict ethical standards. To the mainstream Christian church, Montanists appeared to believe that the new prophecies superseded and fulfilled the doctrines proclaimed by the apostles, which is, wow, how are you going to have a new prophecy that is above the apostles? I just, that is hard to believe that they believe that. The Montanists were alleged to have believed in the power of apostles and prophets to forgive sins. Adherents also believed that martyrs and confessors also possess this power. The mainstream church believed that God forgave sins through bishops and priests. So Montanists basically believed that people could forgive sins. The Catholic church has never believed that. And, and in the beginning, there was only one church and everybody was Catholic. 
And we know this based on a letter that, uh, I don't know if it was Ignatius or somebody else. I can't remember at this time, but there was a letter that somebody wrote around the year 100 that said, hey, we are the Catholic Church. Catholic just meaning universal. We're all over Rome. We all believe the same things. We all believe the Apostles' Creed, uh, which you can look up if you you don't memorize it. It's pretty cool. It's a good way to summarize the faith for anybody who's wondering. Apostles Creed, check it out. Um, yeah, so the Catholic Church, which was everybody in the beginning, always believed that it was God that forgave sins. Nobody else, but God would give power to, he gave power to the apostles, which we have in the Gospels. God, Jesus giving power to the apostles to forgive sins. And the apostles gave that power on to other people that they laid hands on. It wasn't the apostles or the priests or anyone else forgiving sins. It's God forgiving the sins. And the priests and the apostles are just the medium through which God works. Okay, moving on. Montanists recognize women as bishop and presbyters. And this is something that is going on in a lot of Protestant communities. And um, yeah, the Catholic Church has never believed in this. Jesus himself didn't uh, ordain any women. And he had an opportunity the Virgin Mary is probably was, I don't want to say probably, the Virgin Mary was the greatest woman of all history of all mankind, the greatest woman ever. Jesus did not make her a priest or an apostle. He didn't. He could have easily. He's God. He can do what he wants to do, but he didn't do it. There had to be a reason for that. Uh, so, you know, the Catholic Church never believed and still to this very day does not, has not changed the thing that women can become priests or bishops or anything. And they can do a lot in the church. They can be nuns. They can be sisters. But uh, yeah, the Catholic Church has never changed that teachings, although Protestants did. Um, but it wasn't until about 16 or 1700 years later. So uh, Montanists were doing it back in the day. Women and girls were forbidden to wear ornaments and virgins were required to wear veils. So this is kind of like a Muslim thing. They were basically making women cover themselves up all the time. Christians never believed in that. They did believe in wearing veils in church or in front of bishops and things like that, but it was never considered something that women had to do all the time. Um, is It is alleged that some Montanists were non-Trinitarian, meaning that they didn't believe that there were, you know, there was a Trinity, three gods in one. Uh, An emphasis on eth ethical rigorism and asceticism. These included prohibitions against remarriage following divorce or the death of a spouse. They also emphasized keeping fast strictly and added new fast. So um, Catholics don't believe in remarriage following divorce at all. So I don't know why they mentioned this as if it was something Catholics believe in. We don't believe in that. Uh, but we do believe in remarriage after the death of a spouse because in the wedding ceremony, it says until death do us part. So once we are parted by death, hey. I can move on and marry someone else. Uh, Montanus provided salaries for those who preached his doctrine, which Orthodox writers claim was promoting gluttony. Hmm, that's interesting. Some of the Montanists were also called Quarto Deciman, 14ers, preferring to celebrate Easter on the Hebrew calendar date of 14 Nisan, regardless of what day of the week it landed on. Mainstream Christians held that Easter should be commemorated on the Sunday following 14 Nisan. However, uniformity in this matter has had not yet been fully achieved when the Montanist movement began. Polycarp, for example, was a quarto deciman, and St. Irenaeus convinced Victor, then Bishop of Rome, who was a pope, Pope Victor, to refrain from making the issue of the date of Easter a divisive one. Later, the Catholic Church established a fixed way of calculating Easter according to the Julian and then later Gregorian calendar. Interesting note. Uh, Gregorian calendar came from a pope, Pope Gregory, and we still use it to this very day, although with a few changes. So that's Montanism, which is basically the belief that um, there's these new prophecies and the Holy Spirit is coming upon people and kind of using them as um, using them as vessels and kind of making them do all kinds of crazy things and that their prophecy is higher than the apostles. Hey, it's a heresy. Montanism. That was in the 100s. Next, we're going to talk about, and lastly, we're going to talk about Justin Martyr composing his first apology in Rome. Justin Martyr was an early Christian apologist and is regarded as the foremost exponent of the divine word, the Logos, in the second century. He was martyred alongside some of his students and is venerated as a saint 
by the Catholic Church, the Anglican, the Anglican Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Oriental Orthodox Churches. So many, many churches venerate Justin Martyr. Most of his works are lost, but two apologies and a dialogue did survive. The first apology, his most well-known text, passionately defends the morality of the Christian life and provides various ethical and philosophical arguments to convince the Roman emperor Antoninus to abandon the persecution of the Christian church. Further, he also indicates, as St. Augustine would later, regarding the true religion that predated Christianity, that the seeds of Christianity actually predated Christ's incarnation. This notion allows him to claim many historical Greek philosophers, including Socrates and Plato, in whose works he was well studied as unknowing Christians. And that is an interesting idea that people don't really talk about that much anymore. But I think it's very interesting. So we're going to talk about the first apology, which happened around this time. Okay, so do, 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 do. so he was basically addressing criticisms of Christians. In the early chapters of the first apology, Justin discusses the principal criticisms of contemporary Christians, namely atheism, immorality, and disloyalty to the empire. He first argued that the name of Christianity by itself is not reason enough to punish or persecute, and he urges the empire instead to only punish evil actions, writing, quote, for from a name, neither approval nor punishment could fairly come unless something excellent or evil in action can be shown about it, unquote. He then goes on to address the charges more directly in which he argues that they are atheists toward Roman gods, but not to the most true God. He acknowledges that some Christians have performed immoral acts, but urges officials to punish these individuals as evildoers rather than Christians in general. Which I agree, and this is something that I've been talked. I was talking about earlier. Yes, Christians do evil things. They should be punished. They should be put in jail. If they're if they were evil enough and turned away from God, then I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. But hey, that's God's rules. Then they need to go to hell too, right? So if somebody, if a Christian is performing immoral acts, they need to be punished. I am not against that at all. Not every Christian is a saint, and there's going to be a lot of things in Christian history that you're going to see that are jacked up. Guess what? Christians did it because they're not perfect. We had a Judas in the 12 apostles, and there's always going to be Judases in Christianity. Okay, with this claim, Justin demonstrates his desire to separate the Christian name from the evil acts performed by certain individuals, lamenting how criminals tarnish the name of Christianity and are not true Christians. Finally, he addresses the alleged disloyalty to the empire, discussing how Christians do seek to be members of another kingdom, but this kingdom is of that with God rather than a human one. So we're already at about an hour. I want to go more into Justin Martyr. So we're going to start on the next episode with the first apology of Justin Martyr. We're going to talk about this whole thing. And then we're going to talk about Justin Martyr himself a little bit more. We're going to move on in the next episode to Polycarp, Irenaeus, and Adversus Heresies. And maybe we'll get to Pope Victor the i I'm not sure. Because, you know, I'm trying to keep these episodes under an hour. So that's it. Let's do a quick recap. We talked about Ignatius of Antioch and he was taken to Rome and he was martyred on his way. He wrote seven letters and gave them off to different churches and really kind of uh, gave everybody more reasons to celebrate and to be happy about the faith by writing these letters. We still have these letters to this very day. The sum of the Bible was translated into Latin for the people who didn't speak Greek. And then we had three really bad heresies that lasted for dozens or hundreds of years. We had Marcionism, who basically believed that there were two gods, an evil Old Testament God and a good New Testament God. We had Gnostics, who basically believed that you get some special spiritual knowledge by doing certain things or reading certain books. It wasn't very... They believe it wasn't clear what Jesus taught. You had to have a special knowledge. They also believed that Jesus didn't really have a real body. It was kind of a mirage because God would never allow himself to be killed like that. And then we have Pentecostal Montanists who basically believe that they were receiving the true prophecies from God. And they did. They had kind of like um, babbling and, you know, they were doing strange movements and saying weird things and they were saying that the Holy Spirit was taking hold of them and making them do these things and giving them new prophecies that superseded the apostles and sometimes Jesus himself. These are very bad heresies. 
and as you can see from you know what they taught because basically all the heresy is is something that takes you away from the love and the loving embrace of Jesus Christ. Jesus made it pretty simple. Follow my commands, pick up your cross every day and follow me and you'll be able to get to heaven. It's not going to be easy, but it is simple. It is simple, but it's complicated, if that makes sense. Like I said with the analogy of the watch, a watch inside is complicated. I can never figure out how to make a watch, but I can read a watch. It is very simple to read a watch. It's complicated to make a watch. So it's complicated. It's com the path to heaven is complicated. It's very difficult. But the teaching about how to get to heaven is simple. You just have to walk that difficult path. What a heresy does is make the simple teaching of Jesus more complicated in some way or another, which leads you away from the love of Christ. Marcionism says there's an evil God and a good God, which leads you away from believing that, you know, Jesus died for everybody. It's like, oh, the Jews and their God, that was a whole bad thing. Let's just get rid of that. You know, that, that just removes a whole half of the teaching of God, of Jesus, and leaves you with half of the teaching. And then you kind of, I mean, it's just really weird. With Gnosticism, they say there's special knowledge that you have to get. You can't get it everywhere. You have to be a part of the group and get this special Bible. And Jesus didn't really have a body. And, and these things kind of make you respect Jesus less. Like, well, he just kind of imagined he just did like a, a what do you call it? He did a mirage. He did a vision to, and, and died. He didn't really die. So he didn't really suffer for us. So how much should we suffer for him? Gnosticism. First of all, it's like a good old boys club. You have to get in the club to know the truth. You know, that's not what God wanted. That's not what Jesus wanted. He said, go forth and baptize all nations. He wanted everybody to be able to come to him with, in heaven. It wasn't anything about special knowledge. Next, with the Pentecostalists, the Montanists, they believe their prophecies and the things they were doing, they were being taken over by the Holy Spirit and, and just kind of used as vessels and not in, being in control of themselves anymore. Jesus never said that he was going to do anything like that. Jesus has given people visions and things like that. And people have been in ecstasies throughout the history of the church. And ecstasy is usually you just, uh, you're just freezing. You're not doing anything strange or weird. And even in the Bible, you don't see anything like that. When somebody is in an ecstasy, like with St. Paul, he just fell down and you just kind of froze. And he's just like seeing Jesus. He didn't start, you know, he didn't go into a seizure and start speaking in a weird language and all this stuff. He just froze when he came out of the ecstasy, I, I saw Jesus. I was talking to Jesus. And, and that's throughout church history. We have saints who have gone into ecstasies. And normally what it is, is they just freeze. They're looking upon God. They don't know what to do. They're just, they're just there. They're just frozen. And that is not really this, hey, God is just going to take over me and use my body like some kind of marionette, some kind of puppet. And oh, by the way, my prophecies are better than Jesus' prophecies. Like, yeah, that's not cool. That leads you away from the true faith. And Justin Martyr composed his first apology, and we'll talk more about Justin Martyr in the next episode because there's a lot that I skipped over, but basically he's trying to explain the faith. He was kind of one of the first apologists to explain the faith, and you can go to newadvent.org and read the first apology of Justin Martyr. It's a very interesting reading, and it would actually help you to defend the faith against some people who bring up most of what people bring up is really old. They don't have anything new to bring up because Christianity has been around for 2,000 years. So if you read some of these apologetics from the church fathers, you will have enough ammo to respond to them because really nothing has changed. They're upset about the Bible. The Bible has been around for, you know, for just about 2,000 years, just like the church has. So they don't really have any new arguments to give. And that's that for church history. We're going to close out with a prayer, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you come back for the next episode where we're going to talk a lot about Justin Martyr. We're going to talk about Polycarp. We're going to talk about Irenaeus. And uh, possibly we'll talk about the Quarto Decimans and the Easter controversy. Maybe, maybe we'll get there. But we're definitely going to talk about Justin Martyr, Polycarp, and Irenaeus. And in the meantime, in between times, stay holy, my friends. And God bless you. We're going to close out with a prayer and that'll be it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. All right, I'll see y'all next time on the, oh, we didn't talk about what, well, we kind of talk about what we needed to learn from this. We're not going to go into that too much because I went over time, but yep, I'll see y'all next time on the timeline of church history. 
for this was episode five. I'll see y'all in episode six. Stay holy and God bless.